Amen. Luke 18, 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Where's all my righteous people at tonight? And despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And a publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus responds to this parable. I tell you, I tell you, listen to what I'm telling you about this situation. Though it looks one way, the outcome will be another. This man went down to his house justified. How are you going to leave the house of God today? When you go home, how will you be viewed? rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Jesus, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, whatever we need to learn, whatever it is that we need to grasp, help us tonight in this parable. Help us tonight in this word. Lord, that we could truly grow some more tonight. Help us by the Spirit your word in Jesus name and everybody said amen. amen you can be seated I would like to say a good text or a chapter even a chapter if you're willing to read a chapter to sister along this passage and this lesson will be the parable that's found in uh, Matthew chapter 18 especially the portion uh, where the servant is forgiven and then he runs out and wreaks havoc on other people that owe him. Mm -hmm. God, basically the, the, the picture is God showing us great mercy, but we run around wanting to see other people pay for their issues, their debts. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. Sometimes we think because we don't say it out of our mouth, we're being humble. Just remember the devil was kicked out of heaven for his thoughts. That's free. I could stop right here and y'all got enough. When Jesus is speaking about this parable, he's not comparing their deeds. Because then you could just go out and do something good and I'm saved. Jesus is comparing their attitudes and looking at their hearts. We've learned back in Old Testament teaching that when the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, look not on the out countenance or the outside or the expression or the attitude, the height of his stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. God don't look at things like we look at things. For man looketh on the outward appearance. We think success is to have the American dream, but it'll soon turn into the eternal nightmare you can have everything the world has to offer and be lost because the Lord looks on heart you have two people two prayers and two outcomes most of us hopefully remember how we ended last week focus on the point of the uh, better place that the man could be praying while he's beating his chest, asking for mercy. And we got the arrogant person standing over here thinking he's so much better that the better place to be is with someone that I've walked that pathway. That was me before. Let me pray with you. We want, I want to be a person like that. Like I talked about Matthew chapter 18, I want to be the person whose God's forgiven that I go around and I'm I'm going to err on the side of mercy. I'm going to err on the side of forgiveness. I'm going to err on the side of, are you hearing what I'm saying? You know, let me, let me say this. One of the hardest things as a pastor is, is to work with people that are in trouble. Because we want to see as the Lord seeth, and the Lord calls the things that, that are not as though they were. 
And so my struggle with, with anybody and everybody is the potential of where you could be and should be, but looking at where you are. Hmm. It, it, not, there's not one second that I want to turn around and ever hurt, wound, or, well, there's an old saying, there's an old generation that want to put their thumb on everybody before they can prove themselves, yet nobody knows the heart of the person with the thumb on you. You get what I'm saying? You know, a couple of verses of scripture that I've set aside here that I'm with right now. Psalms 34, Psalms 51, and Psalms 57. I'm going to read them quickly because I do need to get my message. I want you just to listen. Just close your eyes and listen and find yourself here. The Lord is nigh. The word nigh is close unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. You hear what I'm saying? Psalms 51, which is David's repentance. This is the portion of scripture where David's repenting. He makes this beautiful statement. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. You see, our human nature is to feign perfection strength that we've attained it affects us we can look at someone and we make snap statements and snap judgments we turn and go, oh my god thank thank him for his mercy that he didn't judge me when i was acting stupid if you've lived more than five minutes you get that right man nothing worse than someone's been around a church a long time and they've forgotten where they come from yeah, yeah, another worse than you get handed a job to do that somebody else did, and they want to turn around and tell you how they did it, and they didn't do very good at it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Everybody's going to have different ways and different ideas, and I don't know anybody that's not going to do their best. Your best may be different than their best, but I don't think anybody's saying, let me do that so I can fail at it. Let me get married because I want to see what a divorce is like. Let me get that job because I want to know what it feels like to be fired. You ever, you ever realize that sometimes human ideology makes a complete fool out of us? We want to stand before God in his mercy, but we walk around in our arrogance. I'm in church and they just be glad I'm here. Heard it more than once from the least likely of places. Isaiah 57 and 15, for thus saith the high and lofty one. You see, there's only one high and lofty. I don't care how tall you are. I don't care how what your wallet says. I don't care what the papers on the walls say. There's only one that inhabiteth eternity. We're all just begging to get there. He inhabits. Hello? whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Listen to this. Listen to this beautiful key. This, this, let me say it this way. This, this eternal attitude adjustment. With him also, that is of a contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Oh, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Help me. Even when I'm on top, I'm still low. Even at my best, it looks so poor next to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Even when I may have succeeded at something or I got success somewhere, woe is me. Oh, let my humble, contrite heart enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Don't ever let me come in the house of God. Think I've come to the place I don't need an altar. I don't need a contrite prayer. That I don't need preaching. That I don't need teaching. That I don't need loving. That I don't need reaching. 
Isaiah reminds us in chapter 53, verse 6, that we all, like sheep and have gone astray, each of us has turned on to our own way. I, I actually, in transparency, that is my daily battle. I face that joker every day. I can never walk into the house of God or step over to my prayer chair in the morning and find that place, no matter what music I got playing, no matter how triumphant I feel in the things of God. Can I ever enter his presence and go, you good, right? I know you're glad I'm here, Jesus. Oh, let me go to the church, make sure everything's running good. Cause... Let me just find some little message to teach these little commoners. I got something I think the church needs to hear. Oh, God, what are you saying today? Yes. yes. Oh, God. I'm, 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 I'm in a dry and I'm in a weary land. I'm in a scary place. I live in a world now that's turning its back on God. I'm living in a place where the majority of churches don't believe baptism in Jesus. They don't turn. Well, I'm surrounded by the enemy. That environment's going to affect my spirit. I'm going to think things that I put away when I came to, all of a sudden now I'm listening to that old music. I'm, I'm watching those old programs. I'm humored by those old dirty jokes. Ah, oh, Jesus. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Anybody here not need Jesus? Luke 14 and 23 says, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out in the highways and edges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. It's going to be impossible for us to focus totally on the kingdom of God while the world has us constantly focused on ourselves. I know so many people think they got it, they got it all worked out. But listen, if your prayer closet's empty, but your storage closet's full, look, this was for folks tonight that are not caught up in just looking like saints of God. People that really know that they are living to serve the Lord. How important is that? Important enough for Jesus to make the statement in Matthew 7, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will. Did you ask him what his will for your life was today? Or did it matter? Did you really say, I give myself to you today again, Lord? Well, my Father, which is in many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and done in thy name been done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There, therefore, okay, understand that that paradigm is a struggling paradigm, right? It's almost an impossible situation. We're between a rock and a hard place, right? But let me tell you that what that therefore is there for. Are you ready for the answer? Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, these parables, and... Do it them. I will liken him unto a wise man. And look, it steps into another parable, which built his house upon a rock. He's about to talk about two other men. How beautiful is the word of God? And it shows two different. See, 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 we don't like to compare. You are judging me. Yeah, not really the word is. I'm just sounding the alarm. What happens when you're being pulled over by the police? It's not a vendetta against you. 99% of the time, there's something. You may have a light out. You may have not used your blink here. When we first of all get on a defensive, just like we do when the pastor preaches, who does he think he is pulling me over? Am 
not going to finish the one on the two builders. That's for another night. But doers and hearers is a constant theme in the Bible. You can't pull that thread out and the carpet stay together. Are right, you hearing what I'm saying? It's a constant struggle. It's, it's so much easier to look and play the part than it is actually to do the work. It's easy. Put on a suit and tie, put on an eye dress and come in here and find that little position, that little role, but not really live it. But I'll be honest with you, and I'm just a secret. Look, when you smart off to me, you let me fully know where you're at. Let me say this. There are some of you in a situation, I can't come look at you and pray you honestly. You're in a bad place because you're not spiritual enough to handle it. True. You know how I know? Serving's not easy for the prideful. I remember someone came in one time, and, man, I went to, went to so-and-so, and they're this in the church, and I asked them why they don't come and do this and that, and they, they, they threw their title out as an excuse. That person came to me, and I was like, well, now you know not what not to do. Right? See, because to really be godly, to really be Christ-like is what's needful to be a real Christian to be saved, right? God will always resist. God will always resist. He's not going to change that for you. <laughs> Did you catch that? <laughs> He's not going to change it for me. His word is forever settled. He ain't changing it. Isn't that what we hold on to? I'm thankful I know his word. It ain't going to change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now the humility that you had when you got saved is gone and you're prideful and you think God's going to change it for you and you get a pass, you get grandfathered in. God's not a man that he should lie. Mm. God will always resist the proud. James 4 and 6, listen, it's, it's beautiful. This is so beautiful. But he giveth more grace. Anybody ever needed more? Oh, yeah, like that little British boy who broke, broke the, 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 the paradigm of that little, little orphan dining hall and he walks up there with that little bowl in his little British accent. Everybody looking at him, you're, re you're really gonna ask you? You've never, no one's ever done it before. Please, sir, can I have some more? Jesus, give me more grace. Give me more grace as I overcome the arrogance of my humanity, the arrogance of, of that because I've walked a few feet with you that I think I've attained some level. Let me resort back to, to that need for, oh, I'm hungry for more, Jesus. Galatians chapter 6, 1 through 3. I'm just going to read verse 3, a beautiful uh, uh, section of Scripture that Paul gives us about People being overtaken in a fault. Ye which are spiritual. There's a restoring that needs to happen. Let, let, me, let me help you with something. If you've ever had aught between you and someone else, remember what it took? It took contriteness on both sides. Both sides realize the relationship's not worth losing over what happened. And yet service after service, day after day, Time after time, God is there with an open heart ready for the contract, but you're, I need to do this, especially in front of people. I'll pray at home. Yeah, it's not the same. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. You know the problem with deceiving yourself? You don't know you've done it. Well, the Bible says, I give you pastors after my own heart. That's why it says, iron, sharpen it. You, you have to ask, you have to honestly ask yourself, is there somebody, hopefully it's the pastor that can look right at you and say, hey, because if you can't be approached that way, you, you, you're in, in the greatest danger for your soul that, that you can be in. Pridefully deceived folks have a tendency to feel so privileged that they go so far even to thank God for not being like other sinners. <laughs> yeah 
That's kind of like flying. That's like finding a fly in your lunch. Ah, Don't see the problem with the prideful that it is that their pride their pride has deceived them is it's the people around them that suffer. <laughs> Just the moment you get that kind of thinking or thinking you're better than someone or you could do better than someone is the moment you've lost that connection with Jesus. Because you're not supposed to be comparing yourself to them. You're supposed to be caring, comparing yourself to Jesus. How would Jesus treat that person that you're railing on? How would Jesus treat that person who you're bagging on your way home from church from or from work from? Oh, I, I, if you hold the title, you better live it because God's going to hold you to it. If you don't get a pass, he's not going to change you're resisting the proud for us. Because if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. Jesus is always on the lookout for people with a servant's heart. When you look at the off scripture where he used and pulled someone out of the what are you using them for? They're weak, they're pathetic. Exactly. Like Saul, man, when you were living your own eyes, I could do something with you. But now look, I've, I've helped you for a little bit and all of a sudden you're arrogant and proud and you think you did it and you think you got it. And you say, you forget. I never want to forget how bad I wanted in this thing. I never want to forget what I wanted in this. And I'm not just talking church. There was a time in my life when I felt a call to preach. But see, when, when you get a call to preach and minister, God doesn't raise you up. He crushes you. A lot of it didn't make sense to me, but I understood, I understood through time, and especially now that I'm on this side of it, don't think that I'm done. I'm not. I, 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 I just have an understanding of what's going on, and I don't want ever want to blame God. I'm not going to get upset at God. I may not understand it all, but I'll tell you what. He's sovereign. And the moment you lose that capacity, the moment you start questioning God instead of yourself, instead of life, instead of sin, God resisted the proud. That's why one went home justified and the other didn't. Sadly, though God is looking for that, the world teaches us the opposite. It teaches us that success is in doing for yourself. I'll never forget one of the, one, a great man of God, a great singer, someone almost possessed the ability the moment he sang the first note, you could feel the Holy Ghost. Ron Ewing just had a way when he sang it. Zip my heart. It may not mean nothing to you. You don't even know him. And I'm thankful I got to be around him a little bit. Not near, near as much as I felt I could have benefited from. But I remember hearing a story that they're in a building program. And he turned around and did the opposite of what success said. Turned around and gave their building fund money. That the Lord told him. You know why we still talk about him today and people in my circle still? Because he lived that way. The world, when you live for the world, as soon as you're gone, you're done. But you live for God. I don't want to leave a worldly legacy for anybody. I want to leave a godly one in church. You know, I'm going to do stuff that's not going to make sense to everybody. In fact, I'm not looking for your approval. I'm not looking for anybody's approval. I want to, approve, I want to be approved of God. I, I, I may do stuff. That, what are you doing that for? I'm doing my best to follow Jesus. Are you? Matthew chapter 25, he makes a statement to people and he says, they, then shall he answer them saying, verily I say unto you, as so much as you did it not unto one of the least as these, you did it not to me. If you bypass the opportunity to do good when it's your hand for others and you don't, but you never bypass an opportunity to do well for yourself, you send God a pretty clear message. It's easy to say no to God, but not yourself. You turn around and justify a bottom line and what's safe. Let me tell you what. If you do everything that's safe, I doubt if you're safe. The Bible's full of people. The people that didn't work out were full of risk. They were attacked by the religious. 
I've had people put fingers in the face and just walk out on me. And that's fine. I'm not going to judge them. I just know that sometimes you need to realize I have to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. And never let how someone treats me dictate how I'm going to treat other people, even if they've done me wrong. I had a beautiful lesson in the Holy Ghost this week by myself. And sorry, guys, I'm going to go long. But I was, was going over a situation where I won't go in detail, but it's not the first, it's not the only, it won't be the last, whatever. And I was. thinking about how I could biblically respond, retaliate, better word. Now, I'm not talking about this. That's too easy. Lord, I'll take a good whoop and just hit someone once. Hello? Ah, uh, see, cowards die a thousand deaths. I mean... I'm on. They, they didn't understand. I didn't. Yeah, I lost. But look at your mouth. Look at your nose. I don't even care. No one expected me to win, but they didn't expect you to look like that. See, that's that old team. That's why. That's why I, God didn't pull me out of, of the miry clay. I don't. I don't even belong here. He didn't pull me out. So there's nothing good about me. I know y'all good, and you got it, and God's privileged to have you in His kingdom. Because you turn around now and then and bless everybody with your opulence and how great you are. God don't get that from me. He's got a full-time job with me. I'm a full-time job. Well, what's he doing up there? I guess. God, the same thing. The devil got cast out for his thoughts. My thoughts would scare you. Stop and think of beyond how many times you turn around and and the pastor heard me say that. God just has a way of getting to him. Yeah, my thoughts. Jesus. Turn your back on me, talk about me. You're supposed, what? Okay. I've done it too. Put me in the right corner. My idiot mouth's going to say something. Like I said, it's every day. How's our Bible study going? Can we be real? Can we be truthful? All we like sheep have gone astray. I never want to walk into the house of God and don't think I'm in need. I need to give more and pray more and fast more and read more, humble more, contrite more. We live in a day that people walking in and out of church, not changing. And sadly, some of those folks are people, you got the right hair, the right sleeves. You got the Bible, you quote scripture, but your heart is bitter and dark and you're selfish. You're a tightwad. And you're pointing fingers at someone struggling with a pack of cigarettes? You ain't got nothing to say when they put those down. You've been like that for 20 years. They, they haven't even gotten church. That's something to think about. That's something we better look at. That's something we better realize or our attitude towards an altar. You know, they see, you're, you're and when I say this word, I mean spirit. You're so beautiful in your spirit because you're open. I want to learn. He said that to say, I want to learn. Show me in scripture where there's a place or a time, especially in us older folks, that we want to stop learning or that we want to get in pastor's face and you want to instruct me. But yet you've gotten a place where no one can teach you nothing. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, think, I think God had to make up for my deficiencies. And somewhere, I believe I got an advantage on all of you. God took that little, it's invisible, just like the innate thing in a seed that causes it to grow. And he put it in my heart. I love preaching. I was telling you about that incident about I wanted to retaliate. And I have people that are pastors in my life. And I know you think you listen to a lot of me, but I listen to five times the amount you listen to. And I, yeah, you better just hear me. 
And so one of my pastoral mentors was preaching. He gets on this subject. And I'm sitting there, and I just start weeping. I just start bawling. I'm a pastor. Come on, I got this thing all sewed up. What am I even crying for? There's no sin in my life, right? Oh, God. See, I'm justified according to what the world says. You're next to Jesus. I failed the mercy. I failed the, the grace. I failed the forgiveness because I'm turning around. I'm not acting anything like him with my thoughts. Mm. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One went home lost. The other went home just like, I don't want to go home lost tonight. I don't want to come here in the wrong attitude and leave lost. I mean, you're too prideful to stand in class for that. Spiritual people are servant-hearted people. People who faithfully serve are humble people. Truly spiritual people are looking to be humble, to be changed, to, to allow God to take them to places they've never done. That costs them. Go look at the Good Samaritan. That's what the story's about. He's got plenty of people, even in the house of God, that walk by the need, uh, that criticize what's going on. That do, but he's looking for that one, the least likely, the Steves, the Lacey's, the Corey's, the Lawrence's. The Chris's, the Joe's, the Eddie's, the Deborah's, the Erica's, the sister, the broken people that realize. Oh God. I'm a sinner. Don't ever think that now I got a pair of polished shoes and a belt to hold my drawers up and a nice jacket that I found anything, that I can pay my bills, that I got some food in the fridge. He's not looking at that. He's looking at who you're feeding, who you're loving, who you're reaching, who you're standing by, where are you going? Are you compelling anybody? Or is your arrogance a stench in his nostrils? Listen, 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 listen. This is beautifully written. Philippians chapter 2. And I'm not, uh, it's going to be a third nighter. Oh, Jesus. Philippians 2. Listen, 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 listen. Listen at this man. If there be therefore, or is that word therefore again? Any consolation in Christ. You need consoling. I can't hurt me. I don't want to retaliate. I'll be better the next 30 years of my ministry because someone did me wrong. I got a right to do this one. If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, Look, you and I ain't going to fellowship spiritually, so who's he talking about there? You really enjoyed your spirit today, honey. If any bowels and mercies fulfill you my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Listen, 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 he's going to get into it our real house. He's going to step into the car with you, the bedroom with you. You're, he's going to step into your mind and heart. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You can't do that if you're gossiping. You can't do that if you're criticizing. You can't do that if you're complaining. You can't do that if you're offended and ought all the time. Just be glad I'm here. He's preaching. Let me listen. Well, the Bruce is preaching. Ain't no one. It, it, look, I don't want him to be like me. I got me all day. Thank God for the simplicity and the joy and the excitement and the transparency of a 60-year-old that looks like he's 30 getting behind this pulpit and forgive my vernacular, but helping some of you old buddy-duddies realize 
You're not dead. Quit acting like it. Are you hearing me? Thankful for a youth leader that isn't so intent on getting up and impressing us with over fanatical exuberance. That was me. I don't need another one of them. <laughs> I'm thankful for what we got around here. I'm thankful. Years ago, when I took the church, we, <laughs> I'm way off, God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you online. I'm not being all eloquent. It's not when you want to pull up later and listen later. It's not theological. Uh, extravagant, definitely not deep. When I took the church, or when I was elected pastor of this church, we had a, a lady in the church at the time, just had no etiquette. She'd belch out loud and she'd do the other, just right out loud, right in the middle of the church. I'm trying to preach all of a sudden. Little kids sitting on the front row doing it. Look, they didn't do that here. They did it at home. It was okay. Therefore, they did it here. Mr. Davenport, I don't know if it was a text or you told me or how you said it. He was realizing he's the pastor of a bunch of old hicks <laughs> or something of that nature. That didn't bother me. That can be fixed. Etiquette can be taught. How to live can be taught. Holiness and ladies covering themselves and men covering themselves and what we live can be taught. You can't fool with a prideful, arrogant person that refuses to listen. So it's all about your heart. It's all about your... It's what's going on in here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Let me finish this. It's beautifully written. Look not every man on his own things. Listen to what he's saying here. But every man also on the things of others. What's he saying? You're so busy making sure you got everything that you're not mindful of those around you. But that's exactly how G he's looking. Are you if you're Christian, if you're a Christian, you're looking to see where you can spend yourself. If you're, if you're like this, well, well, I don't know what that's going to cost. You've missed it. God hasn't blessed anybody for them to be blessed. He blessed them to give through them. And if you don't see that in Scripture, you haven't read it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Let this mind be, it's what he's saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation. Now I've heard some of y'all say it. My family name, my name either. It, it may echo the halls of earth, but it ain't in the halls of heaven. There's only one name in the halls of heaven. Eh, eh, well. well, my name's there, yeah, but it's written down. Hopefully we'll remember it when we get there. Hopefully it's still there, not blotted out. There's only one name echoing in heaven. And it ain't yours. And it ain't mine. It's his, Jesus and took upon him the form of a, I don't like Jesus argued tonight, and was made in the likeness of men, and of God our servants. Is this all right? Are you okay with this tonight? Are you going to follow along in your Bible? And being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What is our death on the cross? Take up our cross and what daily? Die to what? To what? Die. What do you mean die? What? What? Die. How can you die to self when your life is keeping up with the Joneses and don't look nothing like Jesus? That makes sense, Lacey? I know we like to, well, hold on now. God doesn't want me to go without. Really? I can show you where scripture where a man of God walked up and told the lady to give him all she had. I can show you in a place in the New Testament for those of you that are 
Testament challenge. I'm here all week, babe. <laughs> he asked his disciples when they were washing the money to put the money in. They had to put in two mites. Who gave him most? Gave all. See, because let me, I'm, I've said this statement before, but some of you actually really need to sink in. It's not what you put in. It's what you have left. And if it don't hurt, it probably didn't help. I, I know some people, your pride, your ah, that's why that battle's there. Pride is, well, I got to look like a success. You know? Show me people in the Bible. Jesus looked like a real success about the six o'clock on, well, uh, let's read about all that. Let's go. You know, Job was blessed. Oh, God took it all from him. What made him blessed? You realize he had all that, but he never lost his connection with God. And if you read it, you actually find he goes and he sacrifices. A sacrifice costs you for his children. He wants his children to see where his priorities are. It wasn't in the stuff. It was in his relationship with an altar. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. Remember that word? He that will be humble will be exalted, and he that is prideful will be abased. And giveth him a name which is above every name. What does what you do in your name mean in heaven? Because see, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven. <laughs> Things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is very clear about what it takes to be a disciple. He said, if many men will come after me, let him deny. Tell you what, we'll see if you're willing to give to where you're on beans and tortillas or peanut butter and jelly. See, that messes with some of your thought. You don't think God calls for that. God ain't asked me to do that. That's fine. He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And then here's the kicker. For what, pro what is a man profited that she gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So he is talking about salvation. He is talking about an attitude and a demeanor that is salvational and eternal and one that is damnable and hellish. But what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And this whole concept is diametrically opposed to worldly thinking. It does not fit in today's society. I have no problem understanding why people walk out of church saying, I can't do that. But what I can understand is people full of the Holy Ghost. they have be living for God for a little bit because they can't do that. Paul, in speaking to his Bible study student, listen to this. He's speaking to his mentee. He's the mentor. He has a mentee. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Understand, he's mentoring. Corey, this is like me speaking to you. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. wonderful thing I can say about the mentors in my life, I have never heard one of my mentors ever tell me they were without sin. I have never heard one of them act in an arrogant way that there ain't no sin in my life. Never. Not one mentor has ever said that to me. Because Paul not only made the statement, but can, but let me clarify again, he said it to the person he's teaching, Corey, I'm not Perfect. Church, I'm, follow me as I follow Christ. As long as I'm following Christ, follow me. But if I don't, you're on your own. 
humility is held together by honesty. Hey, Tim, come here, son. God did not place me in this calling because I'm issue free. I'm not mentoring you because I'm perfect. I'm mentoring you because I'm familiar with the honesty that it takes to working on overcoming my daily flaws. I'm not qualified because I'm perfect. I'm qualified because I understand I'm still in the process of overcoming my flaws. Because you're in deep trouble, Timothy, the moment you don't think you need outside help to stay right with God. No, 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 hold on, hold on, sit down. Brother Bruce, you come here. The last two times you tried to outthink me, I just want you to stand and face the crowd. You're on the cross, but I need you to nail yourself to it. So nail, nail, nail this hand to the cross. That's a weak cross. Get that thing up there, man. Because if I'm building you a cross, it's going to be more than that. Okay. Now nail the other hand. Only him. You can probably just about do that. You can't, guys. Just like the rich young ruler. Just like anybody else. We all need someone to walk with and say, hey, wait a minute. Thankfully, he's called pastors that aren't perfect that we don't look at you like, you scoundrel, dirt bag, ragamuffin, useless. If you were only like me, follow me. So I follow Christ and I find myself at an altar. Not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus could find himself at an altar. Jesus spoke this parable directly to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. That's a quote. Tells us there's going to be people in the church. Eleven regular. Think they're righteous. You think you are. You really think you're righteous. Oh, wait a minute. I've been there. God for the mercy, the word, the grace, the mentoring, yes. the ability of a pastor or a friend, yes. a friend yes. that, hey, 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 we're all sinners. No one outruns sin here, especially me. Goodness can never make up. Or make us right before God. I could do nothing good enough or righteous enough for long enough to reach the pinnacle of righteousness of God. And I don't need you to save me. I got this. Many people live like they do. History, biblical history is full of those who trusted in themselves and their own, to their own detriment. Sarah literally convinced Abraham, hey, go into Hagar. Because I really don't think God's going to be able to pull this promise off. Don't worry, my righteousness got this. See, see, see the church? Oh, God, I don't know if you, oh, we got this. We don't need God in our service. We don't need the Holy Ghost to move. We don't need the word of God. We don't need to pray. We got Facebook. You don't know what's going on spiritually. You know what's going on on Facebook, but not FaceTime and Jesus. Peter, in his arrogance, said, I'll never deny Jesus. That last business deal you did, you had it to give, and you went to your bowels and said, I'm not. See, it's not a, you think, well, I didn't deny Jesus. 
he says, and those that do it in sayings of mine. Those that really deny themselves, take up their cross. Come on, parents. Come on, lovers, married couples. If you're connected and truly connected, you've got to take the costly days along with the blessing days. Listen, listen, and this is pastoral for the church, and I've got to wrap this up. If you're anything in this church, even if you run around with a title that I'm no longer going to call you, fine. I'm not, I don't care about titles. Even more than Jesus is. What are you actually doing? And if you're somebody around here, there will be sacrifice in your life. Or take a seat. Eat. Eat. Not, not that anybody's better, but until you get to that place to realize, anybody want to be married to someone that's not willing to sacrifice for you? Anybody got kids that it's not been a sacrifice for? <laughs> and then they move back in and there's, you let them, you let them back in, Why? Because it's who you are and not what your title is. Oh, I know I'm preaching and teaching. This is the threshold time for the church. It's a time. It's we're we're, we're heading. Oh, it don't look too good. Oh, it never looked good before. It got great. You know what he's got to do? Hey, Gideon. You know what? I got to kind of weed out some of the pretenders. Hey, hey, hey! I'm going to go to the cross, and Satan's going to sift you like wheat, Peter. But I. Pr- are you going to recover from this? You see, here's the thing is the humble will be on an altar. The humble will be on time for prayer. The humble will take what the pastor says as truth and follow that because we all have to be led and accountable to someone. Thank God you can look at that someone and I say, you know what? I know his manner of life. I know how he speaks. I mean, you know what? He's ridiculous. He answers the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning. He answers it at the dinner table. Only when the situation I'm in warrants that being more points will I, or I know that I can call him later. I'm, a, I'm, I'm there. Not that I'm perfect, but I'm imperfect. And I know, like, wait a minute. I was taught by my pastor. He answers the phone. You know what else I was taught? Every time I've gone to an altar, Jesus met me there. Whether I was in the pinnacle of being blessed or in the valley of being broken, I found that Jesus always meets me there. You must understand that all, the, that true righteousness only comes from God and not any one of us. Paul says that he wants to be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Hear that again. I want to be found in him, not having my own. You know what? Check your righteousness, please. It's filthy rag. You really want to carry around filthy rags? Do you really want to carry around nasty, dirty, filthy? I'm righteous. I got some good about it. Really? Get that out of here. Hello? We know where diapers belong. Hello? Which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Because that lets us know that that's human responsibility. That works is dead. And understanding is that we understand our human response does not earn salvation. Listen to me, listen to me. You could never do enough good deeds to earn salvation. No, not your grandma, not your grandpa, not your grandbaby. No one can earn salvation because they're good or you just think they're fantastic. I hear what I'm saying. Yours and my so-called good works. Manifestations of our love and appreciation to God for His grace and unmerited favor and mercy towards us. I don't do this because I'm good. I don't do this because I'm doing this to appreciate what was done for me. And if you've lost that, if you've lost that love and feeling, 
You need to get that love and feeling back and you'll find it at an altar. Thankfulness is an active ingredient of humility, just like entitlement is an active ingredient of pride. Are you hearing me? I'm going to wind this down and get you out of here. A well-known, successful Christian businessman was in the church, and he was asked to share his testimony. He said, I have a fine family, a large house, a successful business, and a good reputation. He went on to say, I got plenty of money so I can support some Christian ministries very generously. I have good health and almost unlimited opportunities. What more could I ask from God? He paused in a little voice from the back said, how about asking for a good dose of humility? Luke 22 and 26 states, he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger and he that is chief as he that doth serve. The little country boy out there with his little makeshift cane pole fishing. He's slaying, slaying that ridiculous little cane pole and reel made out of a tin can. Little well-to-do kid pulled up on his brand new little bike, pops off the finest fishing pole, the finest tackle. He's fishing with anything anybody could ever ask for, but he's having no success. He wasn't catching nothing. Finally, he walked over to that ill-dressed little country boy with no shoes. Hey! How are you having all this success with this old cane pole and tin can reel? The little old boy looked up at him, missing a couple of teeth. It's a secret my grandpappy taught me. The secret is I keep myself out of sight. So too it is with Christianity. I must decrease as he increases. Let's stand. Our text reads, listen to me. Bow your heads, just listen to me and let your mind paint a picture. The publican, the Bible says, he couldn't raise his eyes to heaven. You see, understand back in those days, standing with your eyes and hands toward heaven was a common prayer posture during that period. But maybe the posture of our heart and humility bear record more importantly as to the true tell of who we are. This penitent man's posture demonstrates true humility. He doesn't even feel worthy to gaze towards heaven. He beat his breast, a sign of grief and remorse and pain and agony of underachievement. That being said, what, what's our heart's posture as we feel his presence? Move up and down in this house tonight. What's your heart's posture right now? He, he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He understood that he really had nothing to brag about himself before God. What could you really come in here and brag about? He understood that, as, that he was a sinner. And that God was his only hope. Verse 14 points something out. He says, the tax collector, not the Pharisee, went home justified. Are you listening? How are you going to go home tonight? Justified literally means right, right before God. Even if all those things were wrong, he went home right How will you leave this place and go home today? When Jesus is looking at your heart right now and he hears your words, listen, 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 can you hear him? Mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner. The sad thing is, is that the Pharisee tur turned with his eyes towards heaven and lifted up 
could not be made right before God because in his arrogance he thought he already was. He needed nothing from God tonight. He needed nothing from God or the house of God or the man of God. He didn't need the music. He didn't need an altar call. Revelation reminds us because like that man said, it says there is a people in the last days that will say, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not, remember you're deceived, that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Hey, there's hope, folks, listen. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see us. How? From the rebuke of the Lord. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent from the mere idea that you don't think you need to. The proud will be humbled. The humble will be exalted. Are you hearing me? The whole context has to do with being in right standing before God. Those who are proud cannot be because they refuse to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. 2 Corinthians 10 tells us to cast down imaginations, thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. Hey, Satan was cast out because of his thoughts. Your thoughts are betraying you. Yes. Cast down those thoughts and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Another version says we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captivity, captive every thought. How do we become humble? I think first we remember who we are, really. Right? Isaiah 6, 6 1. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What, what, where's the house that you build me and where's the place of my rest? We're a small dot in the universe. How am I important to God after knowing all this? Love. Love. For God so loved. Love. Even David couldn't understand why God cared for us. Psalms 8, 3 and 4, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful and son of man that you care? He's provided for you and now, now you turn around and think you did it? As you look at everything God has made tonight, as you contemplate absolutely all that God has done, is it not absolutely amazing that God cares for us so deeply? Aren't you? Is there anybody thankful that in the expanse of the universe, he knows you and I tonight and he cares? I'm going to have to finish. How can we know we're humble? How can we truly know that we have humility? How can we find that place of humility and love that Jesus is talking about? I can tell you how you need to serve, but not only serve, but gladly and joyfully serve the Lord and count it as a privilege that you could deny yourself for the things of God. You do it for the least of all. You do it for the unworthy. You do it for the folks that just like you were. You do it for the folks you look at and say, there ain't no way I can do it for them because that's exactly what Jesus did for you. There's nothing that's going to dilute, diminish, and destroy the pride that you struggle with more than serving somebody else. Jesus himself wrapped himself in the towel and served. I want to close with this. One night in the church service, a young woman in the crowd felt the tug of God on her heart. Amazingly, she responded to the call of God, made her way to an altar, responding to the presence of the Lord, repented of her sins, wept before the Lord. She was then baptized in Jesus' name and glory as he filled with the Holy Ghost evidence of speaking in other tongues.
This young woman with a very rough and questionable past was delivered from her lifestyle, her addictions, and the change in her life was evident. As time went on, she became a faithful church member, involved in every church ministry she could, teaching young children, doing Sunday school, involved in the youth department, singing. She, she grew and developed into a beautiful young lady of God. After a while, This faithful young woman caught the eye in the heart of the pastor's son. The relationship slight subtly grew and it blossomed. They did everything the right way. They were above suspicion. They carried themselves properly. Time passed. They spoke to parents who made wedding plans became fiancés. And it was at that moment that the problems began. You see, some of the folks in church did not think that a woman with a past such as hers was suitable for a pastor's son. And this obvious ministerial future, wait a minute. The church at first began to whisper their disapproval, then to argue and fight about the manner. That's how it starts, little whispers on the way home from church. Then argue and fight. Then it starts breaking out actually in the church, this side and that side. Things became so intolerable amongst some of the church folks, so they decided, you know, we better have a meeting. At this meeting, the people made their arguments and tensions grew. The meeting was literally teetering on, completely getting out of hand. The young woman sat there, tears streaming down her face as she listened to all the things saying how she was unqualified, disqualified. She's upset. She's hurt. Pastor's son looked over and couldn't take it anymore. And he stood to speak. He could not bear the pain it was causing the woman that he loved his wife to be. And he began to speak. This is what he said. My fiance's past is not what's on trial here. Listen to me. What you are questioning is the ability of the blood of Jesus to wash away sin. It is today that you have put the blood of Jesus on trial. So the question I ask you, does Jesus' blood wash away sin or not? He stood there one by one, looking saints in the eyes. The silence seemed eternal and deafening. Then in a blissful, amazing moment, humility reached forth into the church. The entire church began to weep, fall on their faces as they realized that they had been slandering the blood of Jesus. Today, even in our best state of Christianity, we bring up the past and use it as a weapon against our brothers and sisters. Because someone does something differing than our opinion, we actually have so much pride and arrogance we talk against it. Instead of esteeming, hey, I'm with them. That's my brother. That's my sister. That's my pastor. That's our Sunday school teacher. That's our youth leader. That's our girl. That's our boy. That's that safe. That's Souls Harbor safe. That's the first lady. That's the pastor's daughter. Get your hands off them. That pastor loves them. Don't you talk about the garden. Don't you talk about Chris and Hannah. Get your hands off Lacey. Get your hands off the Shaka Bowers. Forgiveness is the very foundational part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the blood of Jesus does not cleanse the other person completely, then you're not clean. Just too much for a Wednesday night. I'm sorry. 
if that's the case, and you are right in your complaint, in your defiance, and you're speaking against me, then you're unclean. your help. I need your help. Because I don't seem good, especially after preaching. I'm tired. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Come on, somebody. What can make me whole again. Is a flow. 